In this video, I'll be discussing two methods that can be used to determine the change in enthalpy of a reaction. The first method is using Hess's law. The second method is using standard enthalpies of formation. Although we'll be focusing on these two methods, there are actually three strategies that can be used to determine the enthalpy change of a chemical reaction. The method used will, determine, will depend on the type of reaction conditions um, and the reaction itself that's being studied. The first method to determine the change in enthalpy of a reaction is an experimental method that we've discussed in the calorimetry videos previously. This is coffee cup calorimetry, taking place at constant pressure. Thus, we know that the change in enthalpy of the reaction is equal to the heat exchange at constant pressure. This experimental technique is really only useful if the reaction or process being studied takes place in solution. There is some uncertainty, especially with coffee cup calorimeters, as they're imperfectly insulated. The second method we can use is a so-called inferential method using Hess's law. This type of uh, method is useful if we know the changes in the enthalpy for related reactions that involve the same reactants and products in the reaction we're interested in. The third method is using standard enthalpy of formation value. This is a calculation-based method. Today we'll be focusing in this video on methods two and three. Using Hess's law is important because like I said, not all reactions can occur in a coffee cup calorimeter. Hess's law takes advantage of the principle that enthalpy is a state function. All that matters is the final and initial states and not how the system arrived in those final or initial states. Generally speaking, we represent chemical reactions as reactants going to products. Take this generic reaction where we have reactant A going to product D. We could also form D by a more complex series of reactions. For example, we could form from A, B, and from B, C, and from C, D. You'll notice in these reactions written on the left that B is formed as a product and then used as a reactant in the reaction listed below. This also happens with C. This means that the net reaction is A going to D. To find the change in enthalpy for A going to D, we can add up the change in enthalpy for A going to B plus B going to C plus C going to D, and this gets us this overall change in enthalpy. This is the principle of Hess's law. Let's look at an example. Here's the reaction of nitrogen dioxide forming nitrogen gas and oxygen gas. Generally speaking, we're given a series of reactions with known change in enthalpy values that we need to combine to solve for the change in enthalpy of the overall reaction. This is kind of like a puzzle. Here are two reactions that involve similar reactants and products to our overall reaction. You'll notice for each one, the change in enthalpy of reaction is given. The rules we need to follow are, as are listed below. If we multiply or divide a reaction to change the coefficients in front of the reactants and products, we need to do the same to the delta H value according to or for that reaction. If we reverse a reaction, for example, we make what is listed as the products, the reactants, and vice versa, we must flip the sign. So if delta H was positive and we reverse the reaction, delta H would become uh, negative. The second is that if we reverse a reaction, we must also reverse its sign. 
For example, if delta H reaction was positive and we reversed the reaction, we would also need to flip the sign. Species that are in the reactants of one reaction and the products of another will cancel. Once we have solved the so-called puzzle, we can add the change in enthalpy values together to get the change in enthalpy of our overall reaction. Looking at this example and the two reactions we were given, the first thing that I noticed is that in the top reaction listed in blue, that's the only reaction which has NO2 in it. We know in our overall reaction we need NO2 to be in the reactants, and in this reaction it's shown in the products. Therefore, the first thing we need to do is to flip this reaction, which means we take the reactants and make them products, and vice versa. You'll notice when I flipped this reaction, I flipped the sign. In the original information, delta H of the reaction was negative 114.4 kilojoules. When I flipped the reaction, I had to flip the sign, making the delta H of this reaction positive 114.4 kilojoules. I think after this, I'm pretty set. So what I'm going to do is take the reaction written in green and add it to the reaction written in blue. Notice I didn't change anything about the delta H value of the second reaction because I didn't do anything to this reaction to modify it. So what happens when I add these reactions together is that I have nitric oxide being formed in the first reaction and then it's being consumed as a reactant in the second reaction. Thus, these two species cancel one another. When I add these reactions, I get, I keep everything that's on the left-hand side of the arrow as reactants and everything on the right-hand side as products. You'll notice that I have oxygen listed in the products of both of my reactions. These add together to be two oxygen. This effectively gives me my overall reaction that I was looking for. And to find the delta H value, I simply add 114.4 minus 180.8 to get my overall enthalpy value. This reaction is exothermic because delta H of reaction is negative. Here are two practice problems that you can do on your own. I highly recommend checking your answers um, either during office hours or tutoring. The second method we'll discuss is how to determine the change in enthalpy of a reaction using enthalpy of formation values. The standard enthalpy of formation is the change in enthalpy when one mole of a compound forms from its constituent elements in standard state. The degree symbol here is indicating standard state. Standard states mean different things for different uh, phases. For example, standard state of gases is 1 atm. The standard state of liquids or solids is whatever the pure substance is in its most stable form at 1 atm. For a solution, the standard state is 1 molar. Here are some examples of pure elements in their standard state which have an enthalpy of formation value of zero. This is a non-exhaustive list. For example, diatomic elements are listed in their standard states as, um, for example, for hydrogen, H2 gas, F2 gas, O2 gas. Bromine is also a diatomic element, Br2, but its standard state is liquid. Many um, metals are solids, as are some nonmetals, and some uh, nonmetals have uh, monoatomic or non monoatomic behavior, such as S8 solid, the standard state for sulfur, and P4 solid, the standard state for phosphorus. You can find a table of this using any reference you trust, including a textbook, um, homework system, or other sources on the internet which have freely available. Um, changes in enthalpy of formation tables where you can find an exhaustive list. The meaning of these values was again to remind you the formation of one mole of that compound from its constituent elements in their standard states. In the case of ammonia shown here, 
it has a change in enthalpy of formation value of negative 45.9 kilojoules per mole. If you look at ammonia, it's composed of both nitrogen and hydrogen. The standard state of hydrogen is N2 gas. The standard state of hydrogen is H2 gas. It's critical that we're forming one mole of ammonia from its constituent elements. That's why the coefficient in front of N2 must be a half and the coefficient in front of H2 must be three halves so that we're making one mole of ammonia. For uh, nitric oxide, NO, we have the standard states of the elements, which are N2 gas and O2 gas. Again, our coefficients must be half in front of N2 and O2 to ensure that we're making one mole of nitric oxide, which has a um, standard enthalpy formation value of 91.3 kilojoules per mole. Now you might wonder where these values are coming from and why they're negative and positive. So an important concept in chemistry is that forming bonds releases energy, okay? Bonds are formed in the products. Releasing energy is an exothermic process. Breaking bonds, however, requires an input of energy and is an endothermic process. Therefore, to get from products, to get two products from reactants, what's necessary will be to break bonds in the reactants, which requires energy, in order to then form products with this new composition, which releases energy. Here, we break bonds. So again, imagine, you know, taking the bonds in the hyd two hydrogen molecules and the oxygen molecule and having to put in energy to break those bonds and then releasing energy when forming the two water molecules with the new bonds shown there. What we can do is calculate the total change in reaction enthalpy. Again, the change in enthalpy of reaction, standard state, using the standard state enthalpy of formation values. What's shown here is that we will sum the enthalpy of formation value of the products times their stoichiometric coefficients and then subtract the enthalpy of formation value of the reactants times their stoichiometric, co stoichiometric coefficients. The reason why we're subtracting the reactants from the products is that the products will release energy um, and the reactants the bonds need to be broken, so this is an input of energy. Let's look at this example. Here's a reaction, and we're asked to calculate the change in enthalpy of that reaction at standard state conditions. We're given the change in enthalpy of formation values for multiple different, uh, for every different substance in, in this reaction. Pause the video and try to calculate the change in enthalpy of reaction value with what you know so far. What we need to do first in this problem is to determine the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients of the products times their standard enthalpy formation values. We know that the products here are two moles HCl and one mole sulfuric acid. Determining or adding in the values shown in this table allows us to determine that the sum of the products of, of their standard enthalpies of formation times stoichiometric coefficients is equal to negative 998 kilojoules. We can repeat this process with the reactants for SO2Cl2 and water. What I got here was negative 936 kilojoules. Now to determine the change in enthalpy of the reaction, we can add, we can take the sum of the products and subtract the sum of the reactants. This gives us negative 998 kilojoules minus negative 936 kilojoules. 
The sign is very important here, so don't forget that it's the products minus the reactants. When I did this calculation, I got an answer of negative 62 kilojoules, which means that this reaction is exothermic. This video has reviewed two different ways to calculate the change in enthalpy of a reaction, one using Hess's law and one using standard enthalpies of formation. To practice, get more practice with the second objective, I highly recommend using this bonus practice problem and checking your answer during office hours or tutoring. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.